in this episode with Kevin Bigger. Manual labor. That's the secret to my success. Underestimate yourself, work in terrible jobs until you get so annoyed <laughs> that you have to do something about it. I was like, hang on a second, hang on a second. I'm early 30s. This is, this is not where I thought I was going to be. If you asked me when I was 11 years old, there's no eggs going down a rolling machine to anything. Um, is this what my life is going to be like? Because that's fine if it is, but I really haven't, don't feel like I've made any choices myself, really. There was a news clip on the TV about the transatlantic growing race. And I thought, oh, okay, well, it's not, it's not, you know, maybe that's... And it was about this um, single woman. She would start off with her husband. The husband had pulled out and she had continued to the end. And so I thought, um, wow, uh, she can do that. Maybe I could, maybe that's the thing I could do. You know, mum, my mum, who was a, always a, a fountain of advice to me, said of a, lots of very <laughs> pertinent things like, Kevin, you're going to see in a coffin. Thank you for coming on the show, Kevin. Appreciate your time. Um, as I said, it's a long time since I, since I saw you last, and um, you, you signed a copy of your book for me, which uh, was, was fascinating. And actually, actually, funny, I have to say. Uh, I was laughing out loud uh, reading it. <laughs> um, and when I, I, I hope you know the spelling, spelling mistakes. Oh, yep. Did I, I just want to, know, want to know what I wrote in it. What, what you said. Did I write anything? Ah, uh, Yes. Well, <laughs> turns out that it was true, that wasn't it? Yeah. We've had an adventure since then. That's true, actually, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's right. Um, I don't know where that time has gone, but uh, but anyway, it's nice to see you again. So thank you again for, for, for joining us today. Um, what, what I'd like to do is start off with, given the, the name of the, the podcast, Life's Work, just ask you a question about how would you kind of summarize what your life's work is? Right now? My, boss, my advice work is, it's a really good question, strangely enough. I like to think that I bring really practical advice to people, slightly, slightly uncommon advice to people about how to take on their own big adventure, their own big uh, challenge. And I'm lucky enough to do that uh, in a conference mostly to people who are in a team. So the most often thing is I'm called in to take, uh, to talk to a large team that has set itself a big goal for the year and they're trying to set that up. They're trying to get people to break out of the way that they're currently thinking and trying to help them to, to, to see that they, to give them some hope and not just hope, but some tools as well to take on their, yeah. their big goal. Yeah. And, and so when you refer to adventure or big goals, it's yeah. not necessarily the advent types of adventure or big goals yeah. that you've had, isn't it? It's it's maybe whatever's relevant to them. What I'm that hoping means the metaphor them. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. They're taking yeah. on an adventure as well. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. the definition of adventure is to take on a bold, uh, take bold steps towards an uncertain outcome. Yeah. Which is any. Yeah. yeah. Any. Yeah. Any large challenge. Yeah. Like people often. Uh, expect me one of the questions i get asked most at the end of a speech is what what are you going to do next and they want another adventure yeah. and i'm trying to argue with <laughs> trying to argue with them as much as i can at the end of the speech 
that I'm not, this is not about my speeches. This is not, not, it's not about my adventures, rather. It's not about what I've done. This is about the lessons that come from taking on any big challenge, whether it's, it doesn't have to be, it just, it's, you know, when you're rowing across an ocean, you get quite good uh, images, which is awesome. But if you're starting your own uh, small business, you know, it's the same, it's the same adventure, the same dealing with risk and uncertainty and mm -hmm. having to plow on through lots of, uh, lots of uh, difficulties and setbacks. And that's the same sort of, that's the same thing yeah. that I do. And hopefully that, that, that uh, uh, metaphor works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. I've got experience of that, so that's yeah. good. So, if I, if I can, then what I'd like to do now is, is maybe just um, nip back to your childhood. Sure. Find out who was Kevin as a as a, a, a young child. Yes. As, um, you know where you grew up, yes. circumstances in which yes. you grew up, and what were you what were you like as a character when you were yes. a child? Well, it's funny you ask me that because I'm thinking about a lot about that now. I think I think there's a point where you get to in your fifties where you reflect on your childhood quite a bit. I've got, I've had kids late in life, so I've got a, two boys, ten and eight, and I often think, um, what their life's like compared uh, uh, with my life. And often, sometimes I go to a conference and there's always a futurist there, and they're talking about, you know, our hair should be on fire, the world's changing, and amazing. Stuff. Amazing speed, and I can't help but think that much of life has stayed the same. But then, when I think a little bit more about it, uh, I think I'm completely wrong. <laughs> I think things were quite different when I was growing up. So, but the answer your question, the young Kevin was uh, lived in the suburbs of Auckland. Nothing special at all. But to live in the seventies is a bit different from living being raised now. I think, like my kids, they come home from school. Whereas we were a little bit more wild, I think. Maybe it's just a slightly when they're slightly older. Like we had a we lived in a cul-de-sac kind of street. And so that you would come home, drink a, a pint of milk, because that's what you did, because milk was practically free. And then you'd go out, you'd run around and play with the kids on the street. And a lot of kids on the street were all the same age. Yeah. Um it was, I guess it was a new subdivision. It had been built in like 1970s, early 1970s. And uh and so uh, all the people were kind of in the same ages and stages. So there were a lot of kids who went to the local school. Um, and so I guess there's this terrible feeling, though. As I got older and older, I realized there's a center of the universe somewhere, and it's not Howick in <laughs> Auckland. And they were saying that. You didn't grow up in the, I'm guessing, in Auckland in the 70s. But there was a, it, was, it was odd that... Kind of that everything cool happened elsewhere. America was really cool. California was really cool. England was getting cool or had been cool in the 60s and still had a bit of coolness left to it. Uh, France was cool. Who thought of France being cool now? You wouldn't say that. Uh, but but now it, but it just wasn't cool. And so but how it wasn't cool. And so I spent a lot of my life thinking I have to get out. Of here, I have to escape. As I got older, you went through the school system, and that's what everybody did. Everybody left and went overseas for yeah. a year or two, and then, yeah. and then came back. And I was definitely into that. Yeah. yeah. But as, but as a as a young kid, you said you were out playing on the streets with yeah. with other kids, and so were you an outgoing kind of. But were you, were you an outdoors person? Were you a shy retiring kid? Were you? I like, was a shyer kid, so I wasn't. I definitely wasn't an extrovert. So there are some kids who have lots of friends. Mm -hmm. I've got one of my sons is like that. And then you have the other kids who has a small number of very close friends. Yeah. And I was more like that kid. Yeah. So yeah. I was academic at school. Um, but, and all my friends were as well though. So yeah. it doesn't, didn't seem strange. Uh, uh, but probably the most formative thing about my childhood, and there's a few things, but I had a stutter, which was quite bad, quite marked. Right. Uh, in that it, did interfere with me interacting with other people. Right. Not so much friends, I guess, but certainly in school. And that got worse as I got older. It was all right at primary school because you're not self-conscious. But as you get older and more self-conscious, then it gets worse and worse as you try to avoid the stutter and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so that was probably one of the more, more defining things of my life, I think. Um, and so the other problem was I was the third son. So there were two olders in front of me. So I don't know what... They, What's the third child supposed to be like? Probably a bit 
Where, do, where are you in the birth order? I, I was first. First. Well, see, first oldest. is responsible. Yeah. First has the weight of parents' expectations on them. You've got a lot. You've, you've got to raise your mum and dad as much as they raise you. By the time you get to third, it's pretty laissez-faire, right? The kid gets to do what he wants. So I was a little bit like that, probably. And uh, my older brothers were poor, probably, probably more responsible. My eldest brother was very athletic, athletic, and my um, next eldest brother was very smart, academically very gifted. And so struggled a little bit with that, but they actually went to a different high school than me. A new, a new school had been uh, built a bit closer, so I, I went to that school, which perhaps helped a little bit. And, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, were you, were you out and about doing, you know, having adventures as, no. as a kid? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. No, no, I wasn't necessarily. Like, I meet kids who go pig hunting with their dads, right? That's an outdoorsy kid. I'm not that kid. I wasn't that kid. Yeah, yeah. No, we just had a really normal upbringing. Like, I played soccer. I was in scouts. Um, that's about, you know, that's about it, really, of the outdoorsy kind of stuff. We yeah. didn't really go on camping trips with the family or anything like that. Yeah. So no, no, there was nothing, there was nothing like that. So this is a segue to why I do big adventures. Well, it's just, you know, I've sort of maybe kind of seeing if there's any, any connection from your childhood to, no. you know, who you became. Um, I'll tell you, you know. what, I'll tell you there is one thing. So we were bored a lot more when we were kids <laughs> compared to my kids. And my grandmother had a batch at Waihi Beach, and every year we would go to this old batch. And when I say old, they had bought the Lewin from the outside, and that was a bit of a, a that was a major upgrade, a renovation because <laughs> the Lewin was inside. Uh, and so um, the sun would come in on an afternoon, and they had into the bunk room where the kids slept, and they had these old National Geo graphics there of the 60s and it was all Jacques Cousteau no one knows Jacques Cousteau you know Jacques Cousteau, yeah. Yeah, Jacques Cousteau. and his underwater world and he built these amazing little uh, not just the submarines but he had a in the Red Sea he lived for like 30 days in this beautiful uh, saucer shaped thing under the ground very futuristic then of course there was the, the whole space program and things like that and they were into it a lot more into adventure the National Ge uh, Geographics were into adventure back then and I used to read those and read a lot of adventure books. Um, the, the story of Robin Lee uh, Graham's boy who sailed around the world when he was like 16 years old. Loved that book. Um, Thor Heyerdahl, Thor Heyerdahl, before he did the Kontiki expedition, lived for a year on an island in the Pacific. Lots of books about yeah, people doing exploring kind of things. It was lots of people in the 70s were building a boat in their backyard. That sounds funny. Right. But you would listen at night to the sounds of hammers hitting back. And you see them, you don't see them so much anymore. Um, but that was a thing. People would build yachts. There was, I think, a famous book had been written about someone who sailed up from Auckland to Wellington and lived in the Pacific Islands, sailed in the Pacific Islands. But that dream of escape mm. was very, and I think sort of caught the tail end of that. I don't know. Um, my high school, Maclean's College, has these incredible views out of the Hauraki Gulf, the sparkling waters out to the islands. And it was, I did think a lot about how amazing it would be to be able to get out to one of the islands, you know, to be able to yeah, paddle yeah, out yeah. to the islands. Yeah. But this, the choice to do adventures later in life came from quite a different angle. Okay. You can ask me a question about that or should I just grab it on? Well, yeah, before you do, I, I was, I was going to say, you know, did, based on what you've just said there about your childhood and reading these adventure books, did that give you any idea, uh, you know, as a child, what you wanted to do when you, when you grew up? Yes, I wanted to be a scientist, right. an inventor. So my dream job, like you see at the start of Chitty Chitty Bang, Bang, bang. I still have a stutter now, as you can tell. Yeah. Chitty, chitty, uh, uh, bang, bang, bang. There's a, I think you call them a Heath, a Heath Robinson machine or something? Or a Heath oh, okay. Robinson machine, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's a gadget. It's not reinvention. Like the egg comes out of the chicken and rolls down a pathway, then hits itself onto the fry pan, which spins out and the bacon, <laughs> you know, that kind of weird stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. love those sorts of 
yeah. those gadgets. And I think that's what I thought being a scientist was, was inventing stuff. So one of the coolest things about being an adult is you get to go to Mitre 10 and invent stuff. <laughs> so yeah. the kids have a flying fox in the backyard. Right, now, and yeah. a, they had a go-kart out of an electric uh, drill, which we drew. Okay. Yeah. There's lots of stuff on YouTube now. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> so I, yes, so I wasn't so taken by that. I mean, that wasn't going to be me. I didn't think, I didn't put myself into those images. But they planted a seed, you know, of those yeah. adventure stories. They really yeah, planted yeah. a seed. I think you've got to be careful about what goes into your head when you're 9 and 10 and you don't know how the world works. It really can, yeah. can really comes back to haunt you. In fact, it was those zombies that I had to kill that was part of the process of, We'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, what was your question? Uh, yeah, so it was about you know what you wanted to be when you grew up. What I wanted to be when I up. What to yeah. be a scientist, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's an interesting point that you just made there. You have to be careful what goes into your head at nine, ten years old, and you know, just as a as a bit of an aside, it, I suppose it concerns me. I because I, I agree with what you just mm. said. Uh, it concerns me what goes into our nine and ten year olds' heads these days. We're exposed to so much more stuff mm. uh, than what we were when. You know, when we were kids growing up in the 70s and mm. you had to sort of make your own entertainment, mm. that's a little bit of a concern, isn't it, then maybe that, you know, what, what's the future look like for our, the, the young generation today with, with what, what they might be able to access online or, you know, have their minds kind of influenced by? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I am a bit concerned, not terribly concerned, but I am a bit concerned. We were bored more for sure and like, Getting my boys to read now, one of them will read if a book's there, but they wouldn't hunt it down. Like for us, we had to go to the library mm -hmm. and it was a big deal to go to the library and we were happy to go because mm -hmm. there was nothing else much on. You know, two TV yeah, channels, yeah. you know, there wasn't a lot going on. <laughs> and the library was a fantastic release for us and we couldn't read Tintin and Asterix books all the time. They just weren't there. My kids would just read Tintin and Asterix all the time. Uh, so we had to read a bit more widely, widely than that. So... Uh, yeah, I don't know what's, how it's going to happen mm. with that. Mm. But maybe they have, but they have other sources of stim stimulation and inspiration as well. Yeah, you know? yeah that's, that's know. yeah, exactly right. Yeah, maybe there's that on the positive side. There are yeah. there are more things that can positively influence yes. as well. I suppose. Yeah, they will know know how to fold a fitted sheet in a way that I will never know. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know how to do when I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kevin, growing up through school, you you were academic. You said I think. Mm. Um, I, I think the way that your books um, are written, the written word, um, mm. I was thinking about that. When I thought, you know, how do, how do you learn to write uh, write like this? But maybe it's through school, but also from reading a lot, maybe. I don't know. I read a lot. Yeah. I read a lot. And um, this book was extraordinarily painful to give birth to. I, <laughs> and the trick is to write, to write an 80,000-word book, you write 40,000, 400,000 terrible words. There was some author who said, you read a lot so you think that you can write, but when you come to write, it's like you're an armless, legless person <laughs> with a crayon in your mouth. And that's just what it felt like. Yeah. I was like, I can, I can read so I can write. Yeah. And I would write a, write a sentence. And I'd go, that is just primer one. That is so awful. Yeah. Um, but I eventually learned the art of, the, the art of, uh, of writing a book is you, it's all the editing. Because what you do know, if you've read a lot, is what's good and what's not good. So you read what you've written. Mm. Pretend it's written by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and then just put a line through all the yeah. stuff that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so this took, book took me years and years wow. okay. uh, to write. Uh, out of interest, it's based almost entirely on a, uh, a Walk in the Woods by Bill uh, uh, Bryson. The okay. story of him walking on the Appalachian Trail. So that's a book where nothing much happens, right? And I was like, when I came to write a story about running across the ocean, I was like, oh, gosh, nothing much happens. Mm. Day three is day 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How can I possibly make this work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I used, that, I used that book as a guide yeah. very much. Yeah, well, it worked. It worked really well. So can we go back then to, to school? You're, sure. you're, you're yeah. coming through school. And where did you go beyond school? What was next for you? Well, you're going to catch me out a little bit because I said I wasn't very adventurous. But at the end of school, uh, our, our school was supporting 
the Himalayan uh, Trust. So the school would raise money every year to give uh, and it would sponsor students to go to Nepal and work alongside Sir Evan Hillary while they built a school or a, um, or a clinic or something like that. And so uh, the year after I finished seventh form, that's what I did. So I just, um, worked all that summer, then went overseas, travelled through India, and then went to Nepal and then worked for a couple of months up in Nepal. Um, and so that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. That was camping um, and helped build a school onto the back of a monastery. Uh, so that was, that was an amazing experience that really blew my mind in a way. Like if it gave me the taste for more uh, travel overseas, but not, again, not for adventure. I didn't right. look at, in fact, when I went to Everest Base Camp, I was like, that is ridiculous. You look up, you can see it. That's, it's hard enough to breathe at base camp and you haven't even started yet. I was like, that's, impo that's impossible. That cannot be done. So I wasn't. No, it didn't, got no bug. No, no not bug. tempted. Not tempted. A fantastic experience, but not tempted. Yeah. Yeah. Did my university degree in physics. So after a year, I was like, this is a terrible mistake. This is a terrible mistake. <laughs> what am I doing physics for? I did physics because I quite liked physics at school. I like, I like maths and physics because you get an answer right, right or wrong. Whereas like English, there's a lot of opinion involved. I didn't like that. You know, art has is probably the worst. Art history is just all opinion. Mm -hmm. I wanted something that was, you could learn it, go into the exam knowing you knew it, get it right, get a tape. Did physics, took a year before I found out it was a terrible idea, tried to swap to medicine. So I was in, I've ended up uh, marrying a doctor. So I do wonder if I would ever have made a good doctor. Uh, yeah. Probably yeah. not. <laughs> I would have been a funny one. I think it's strange. I don't know what would have happened. Anyway, uh, so, but you know, the other thing I was talking about, there's a book that I'm keen to write about this. Uh, and it's we talk about our lives as if we're in control of, the li of our lives. You know, and of course, we, the decisions that we make are very consequential. But we tend to tell a narrative in our head about how. Um, we are the author of our lives. But then when you reflect back, and you can do it when you're our age, about the ups and downs of what was happening economically, for example, as well as politically, that were equally as large in terms of the forces that they were placed upon us. This is a long way of saying that if you finish university now, it's a great time. The people are, are, are lining up to employ you. If you're finishing university in 1990, nobody wanted to know about you. Mm. It was the worst possible time. You were, you, were you here or in England at the time? I uh, came to New Zealand in 98. Yeah. 98. Mm. So that's 1990, that's like end of Thatcher. Yeah. That's like the worst possible time, mm. right, to be in England. The economies were collapsing all over the world. Here it was. Inflations were inflation was double digits, unemployment was double digits. I think it was just an absolute shocker. Uh, so, but I came striding into the market with my physics degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, uh, luckily, I had a plan of getting a job. I always was, was going to go overseas. But that bit a couple of years afterwards, when I called up down the phone, and says, "Oh, time to come home, Dad." He says, "No, it's hopeless still." You know that economic hangover was lasted for some years. So I ended up staying overseas for four years <laughs> and did a lot of travel and worked a lot of terrible jobs. Sorry, where, when you say overseas, where, where were you based? Started in America, yeah. worked in a ski field there, then travelled around South America and Mexico quite a bit, then went to Europe. I went to work, worked at a pub in London. I'm getting my dates wrong, but a pub in London, travelled around Europe, back to, back to working in London, more pubs, more ridiculous Manual labor. Mm. That's the secret to my success. Underestimate yourself 
work in terrible jobs until you get so annoyed <laughs> that you have to do something about it. So I um, actually, that's an interesting thing. You know, it's a very interesting thing about. I was interviewing people for a scholarship, and I was asking them what this is to get to, into university, and I was asking them what jobs they had done, because I always had jobs like working in the news. Because we were always there was no there was no money, none. So if you wanted to buy something, you had to pay it with your own money. And that was like since I was, I don't know, 11 or 12. So it was newspaper rounds, several of them, working in a butchery, uh, working in supermarkets. It's just lots and lots of things. Rainbow's End. Rainbow's End used to have a, a large bird as a mascot, rainbow bird. Um, feathery suit, lots of rainbow colours. Actually, it's very, very trendy to have it now. Um, I can reveal for the first time on air <laughs> that I was Rambo Bird. Right. There are people out there going to be very surprised <laughs> by this. Um, there are several of us. but So I was an actor. Yeah. Great being an actor when you can't, they can't see your face. Yeah. You're, just, and you're walking around handing out sweets. That's probably the best acting job you're going to get. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, did a lot of work. People nowadays, I'm not sure young people work so much or that's such a thing. But anyway, the side effect was and worked overseas again in terrible jobs, uh, you kind of, yeah, there's a, there is a risk that you will think that's all you're good for. That's all that you know, that's all you do. And that you are just a unit. You're just a work unit. Tell me, please tell me what I can do and I'll be good at it. And that's what you do. You don't see a bigger picture. And so I had a very unsophisticated view of the business world and I was... Um, pretty good at being a work unit for, and in the service industry for a while, which was a terrible idea. Like people who had got accounting degrees or something like that were making lots of money in London. Mm -hmm. Or lawyers and things were doing great. And here was I, you know, serving, serving pints of beer. Uh, anyway, decided that had to... Uh, I had to, to do something to change that. I couldn't get a job with a physics degree. I didn't want to pursue that any further. What was I thinking? Could I just say in terms of advice, or wisdom of advice, uh, people in my experience, certainly when I was, when I was a, a uh, student, we got terrible advice about the future, about careers. Terrible. Terrible careers advice. Um, and... No structure for thinking about the issue, about what to do. Nobody thought about the money. What do you love doing? If you do what you love, you'll never work another day. Again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of the, that was actually not bad advice compared to some of, I don't know, I don't know. Um, so I've got quite strong views about that now. I think people should, I would... What I found that the course of my life, I started off being very idealistic, and in the as you get older, you get you're more concerned about paying for the house and how you're going to feed your kids. The money becomes much more important. And would I rather be a poor person working at the zoo feeding animals, or getting not being paid very much, or will I get paid a lot of money? in a company doing something that I don't feel particularly strongly about, but I got paid a lot of money. You know, in when I was younger, I think it would have been, you would have talked only about doing what you dreamed about, helping, saving the, the world. But as you get older, you just get so much more practical. Don't you think, Steve? It's, it's an interesting take. I, yeah, I, I've found the, the yes. opposite to be true for me. Oh, fantastic. Um, but that's only because I think... Um, I found myself in roles or jobs or organisations that uh, were having such an impact on me personally that worrying about the money was secondary, if that That's makes wonderful. sense. That's you know? wonderful. Yeah. Um, Sorry, impact on you in a good, in a good way? No, no. Oh. <laughs> in, in a not-so-good not so way, you know? And oh. so it's like that whole kind of, you know, to, to your point earlier around, you know, find something you love doing, but at least be happy-ish, right? If you, if you can't be happy at work, mm. it takes a toll. 
I think, not just on your work life, but also on your home life too. Sure. I think you take that stuff home with you. Everyone talks about the baggage you bring from home to work, but I think there's also a baggage you can take home as well. Sure. And I was finding that. Um, so for me, the money became less important. I think as, as I was younger, yeah, I had big dreams, big ideas. But actually the center of it was to try and get to a certain point in my career where I was earning X amount of dollars and could afford this and could afford that. Um, and then when I got there, it kind of wasn't what I'd envisaged it would be. It didn't feel right. Um, so, you know, I was, took a massive pay cut and here I am. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, for me, it's more about enjoying. But I, I, your point is, and I think relative to what you were saying about the, the, the next book you might write, about the influence that we have. And maybe as, as we get older with those kind of external pressures that you've got to pay the mortgage, you've got to be able to put the kids through school, you've got to this, that, and the other, and every, every direction you look at them and it, there's money going out the door. Mm-hmm. That subliminally is telling you you've got to earn more money. So that becomes the, the focus, the unconscious focus, um, whether you like it or not. It's, it's hard to, to think otherwise, isn't it? It's hard mm-hmm. to look at just enjoying life when... Everywhere you go, you've got to spend mm. what seems to be these days a hell of a lot of money on some of the basic things. Mm. Yeah. So there is an influence out there for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Mm. So let's, if we can go back to what you were talking about then. So you were you're traveling, you're working in different roles, being an actor, <laughs> <laughs> uh, working in pubs and things like that. At what point did you end up at um, Boston Consulting? Well... That's about four jobs in. Uh, I worked so uh, I had a good hard think when I was in London, sick of working, doing this, thinking how do I get myself out of the situation I was in? And I decided what I needed to do was to do a to retrain, as it were, to do something, to do a master's degree in something that was something that I did feel very strongly about. And 1990 was also a very significant year in terms of the in environmental movement and I was very uh, enthusiastic I I was very keen to do that's that's something I felt strongly about I wanted the the state of the world's global uh, environment was something I felt strongly about and so I ended up doing a master's degree in environment and development at Cambridge University and that led me after that to, I did a lot of, I, my thesis there was on the cost of wind farm energy in New Zealand. So then I had links with the Ministry of Commerce, which included the old Ministry of Energy, and worked for a unit there. And then after a year, I think, I worked, moved over to the Treasury and worked in the International Economic Section there. And... Uh, wasn't particularly happy there. Um, and then from there, saw an ad to work as a management consultant for the Boston Consulting Group and got went through a number of interviews mm-hmm. and got that role about 1998, I think. Right. Uh, well, not a bad time to be a consultant in terms of, of, of timing. It was the dot-com boom was pretty large then. Lots of work about Y2K was a concern as well, that, you know, all the computers are going to switch off. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, forget about that. Yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, but things, the, the stock market was roaring at that point. Things were going great, and so it was a good time to be a management consultant mm. for a year or two. Mm. Uh, then I was there for the crash. <laughs> um, and your question though was, how did I get there, or how did I leave there? Yeah, uh, at what point? And you've, you've yeah. obviously you've told us how you got there, and, and clearly there was a step up from um, serving pints and, and the, and the yeah. pub to, to yeah. getting there. There was a bit of a difference yeah. in several jobs before that. So, um, you know, what was what was your thoughts at that time about where you wanted to go or where you thought you were going career wise? Well, the thing was, I worked working in the government, so I started off idealistic, and then I worked for the government, and I quite enjoyed the fact that you could have a say in major national policies, obviously a very small say as a junior assistant or something, whatever it was. Um, but you were, looking, you were looking at some serious issues there. Uh, but it was more satisfying to move one step closer to the problem in a way, working, moving to the consultancy field, because now you're not, 
it's now it's not hypothetical, you're actually working with real people with real skin in the game. Um, so, sorry, Mark, did I ask your question or not? Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm asking about where you thought you were going to go career-wise. Oh, okay. uh, so once I got there, I was pretty focused just on what I had to do at the time. I wasn't really focusing on the future. Yeah. But most people work there for a few years and they go off to um, a major corporate, mm. you know, sort of mm. end up getting yeah. a job. A strategy job in a bank or something like that. Right, yeah. That's what I guess yeah. some of my colleagues are yeah. doing now, that, 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 that kind of thing. So I was going to be working in the corporate world. Is, yeah, that's what I'd be doing yeah. somewhere. And, and so you were uh, – Okay. And so you, you were – how long were you at Boston? For like four or five About years? About three, like three years. I three, think. okay. Um, yes. And so, and so from there, I, you know, from, yes. from reading – Well, I was um, in, the, in my mid-30s now. Yeah. Early 30s, sorry. Very early 30s. In fact, 30 was a bit of a watershed. And you see it coming. It's, a, it's odd being a guy getting older in your 20s. You just, nothing, time doesn't change. You know, everything's the same. Nothing. Uh, you don't change that much. Uh, a year seems an infinite period of time. You can't plan that far ahead. No, no, no one can plan what, what's going to happen. Uh, you want to have fun. That's all you want to have fun to do. Um, and I guess some of my friends were starting to get married. That was a bit of a concern. There we go. Uh, but, um, yeah, I was really just focused on the moment very much. And I saw 30 coming, and it came, and that's not a really a big deal. But it's then it's when you become like 31, and now you're 30-something. And now you're like, hang on a second, I'm starting to see the future a bit more now. This is going to happen again at 40, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you're not quite as fit as you were at 31 as you were at 21. And you start to, for the first time, have a feeling of the passage of time. Right. And that was an eye-opener to me. Because if you had said, let's plan something for this time next year, I'd have like, anything could happen. I have no idea what you're talking about. Why would we do that? Why don't we wait until we're a bit closer, right? But now I'm actively planning things further ahead than much further ahead than that because I know what time what time does I had no idea of time it seems funny now but that my experience of life was quite different you know I was this is a bit esoteric now but when I went I was unhappy I guess but you're, you're always unhappy as a teenager you know that general sense of things and I thought going overseas I'd find a different me there'd be a different me that would be out there things would be different and I'd experience life differently and I'd be happier as a result I read a great quote somewhere about the problem that when we go overseas, we take ourselves. <laughs> uh, so you're asking me to comment about what, I, what I'm doing in the 30s. And I have to remind myself that I was quite a different person. You would not have different conversations with me then than I would yeah. now. So it's difficult to go back into that, yeah, that, that idiot's head. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so... Um, Working very, very hard at BCG. Um, a lot of stress, felt the stress. Mm. It's funny you talk about stress now. And I um, I was angry the other day. I went to a conference and there was a guy who was talking about stress, but it was actually he was uh, just a comedian. And I was, as it turned out, but the speech had quite a serious topic. Uh, I was looking forward to it because I was I I'm always interested to hear about people talk about Stress, because I don't think you should joke about it. <laughs> I mean, I talk about stress too, but I don't, and I tell jokes while I'm doing it, but I think it's a very serious topic because mm. it can, um, I didn't have a breakdown. I didn't have a breakdown, but in retrospect now, I think I was getting, starting to fray at the edges quite a bit, right. quite a bit. Um, and the odd thing about stress is that uh, it's self-inflicted. Mm. You are the hammer and the anvil inside your head yeah. it's and but it's you that's completely non-obvious to you when you're living it yeah. it's not the situation at all mm. not the situation um you think that you are it is it is it is life and death the stuff that you're going through you don't yeah you know so so but i mean it's, it's an interesting point i think to talk about if, if you're happy to because yeah. i mean what was uh and it's, it's not a necessarily a straightforward or easy um, question to answer, but what do you think was causing or leading to your stress at that time? Was it the you, you've mentioned about hard work and 
and pressure. You know, was that what was causing you stress from a work perspective, or were there other things going on as well? Yeah, there were other things. Um, I was concerned that I found it hard to fit into the workplace. You know, ever since I started work, <laughs> I just I didn't quite get it. I didn't quite understand what was going on. There's some people who are very good at it. They can walk into an office and by lunchtime they know all the politics, who's in charge of what, who's trying to do what, how that fits in, what, they're, you know, what to say to who. And, and I, I have no political sense whatsoever. I'm really a task-focused person. You know, I really think about what the thing is you've given me. And if that thing it needs to make sense, because if it doesn't make sense, then I'm in a lot of trouble. And I'll spend a lot of time spinning wheels trying to make it make sense. And at work, you sometimes just get nonsense. You, know, you just get told to do complete rubbish. Or something that's really impossible that can't be done. Or something that involves... I don't know, just, it's just this complete unstructured chaos. Uh, and so... And you're trying to exceed expectations all the time. But that really... What that stops you from doing is talking to your boss more as, more as much as you should. And you, but even if you did, your boss is sick of you anyway. He doesn't have enough time for you. He's always got other things on. So why are you bugging him with another question about what you? What does he actually mean when he asks for this? So that would often go wrong for me. Uh, and so I'd work quite hard, but I wouldn't really feel like... I worked quite hard in the treasury. I didn't get on with my boss particularly well. And he didn't think much of me, <laughs> much of me for sure. Um, and so I guess... There's a risk that you start to feel that you're not much good at this. There was, that was definitely a plausible, you know, it was there in the back of my mind. Maybe I'm not much good at working. Maybe I should have stayed, I don't know, I don't know where or what I could do. But I needed to do something. I needed to work, right? Uh, so I doubted myself. I doubted myself a lot. So I had a lot to prove when I went to, to, uh, to become a management Sultan, and that that's uh, that's even more ambiguous because the client often doesn't know exactly what they want. I said, I asked my boss once. I said, "Why are we talking to the client? Why are we going to interview the client about what they want out of this project that we're pitching on? Because they've told us what we want." He said, "If a client is asking you what they want, they almost certainly don't know what they want. You know, they want something else, and there's something to be said for that. There's lots of reasons." that you are being brought into a situation that have nothing to do with solving an issue. Like there'll be a, a fight that the CEO wants, has a particular agenda that he wants to push that the other, the board members aren't supporting it. So what are you gonna do about that? Um, there are, there is, it's a very intensely, it's a very difficult, difficult role. And the people who do it well are magnificent. Uh, I work with the geniuses, absolutely extraordinary people. And that's the best thing I think about my legacy, I think, of working at BCG is that the people I was working with uh, were just unbelievable out in this world. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but I couldn't rank myself amongst their, you know, I felt uncertain. You know, it's, it's not a place for an insecure person because it's, it relies a lot on confidence. And uh, it, so I had some cases that went well, some cases that I didn't think went, you know, didn't go particularly well. You get asked to do impossible things. Mm. Sometimes it doesn't go that well. Um, I was possibly a larger issue at the time was I was in a relationship that wasn't working out as well. And so I really felt like, and then I had this extended issue of the fact that I could see what, I could see time for the first time. Mm. I was like, hang on a second, hang on a second. I'm early 30s. This is, this is not where I thought I was going to be. Mm. If you asked me when I was 11 years old, there's no eggs going down a rolling machine to anything. Um, is this what my life is going to be like? Because that's fine if it is, but I really haven't, don't feel like I've made any choices myself. Really, like, I, like when I needed a job, I'd pick up the newspaper, try and find a job kind of thing. You know, I, didn't, I haven't really thought about the whole planning of what I was trying to achieve or what the whole plan was. So that led to this really... Uh, so I quit my job at that point. It took it well. It took, in theory, I think, extended leave of absence. 
at the end of the case, took his deadly weapons. Um, broke up with my girlfriend, went back to live with mum. And then just, actually I went overseas again. I had a friend who was getting married overseas. Went overseas, visited her, went to Spain, learnt Spanish for a few weeks, ran out of money, came back home. Now what do I do? Got to do yeah, something, yeah. right? Now yeah. what do I do? Yeah. You've got Kevin with a clean slate. Mm. What does he do? But you've, you've created that clean slate for yourself, though, right? And, and I think maybe if I could ask you a question, and you know, again, if I'm delving into stuff you don't want to talk about, that's absolutely fine. But, you know, what was the point where you said, actually, I need to leave my job, uh, break up in this relationship, finish the relationship, and, and, you know, create that clean slate for yourself? Because that's, you, to be fair, you probably kind of brushed over that fairly yeah. quickly, but that's a significant it is. thing in anyone's life. It is. All of those things happening at one it is. time. And, and I hope it, I'm giving the impression that it was, unfortunately, it wasn't as, I felt forced, to, uh, I had to do it, I had to do it. I felt I was one step in front of the boot. I was going to get asked to leave, probably. Mm -hmm. Not that anything had gone spectacularly wrong, but I wasn't performing at the level expected, I don't think. I don't think so. That's what, at least that was going through my head. I don't know. But I mean, um, even even that's good insight, though, isn't it? Yeah. And, and people, in general terms, I think, tend to fight that that they are good enough, and that you know, and, maybe, and get into I mean, a situation that becomes worse by because of it. Maybe. I, I think. I think. I mean, now looking back, I was the wrong person for some of the roles that I had. It wasn't so much. I just. I don't. My brain doesn't work that way in some ways, and so. I think now I'd ask. I'd be a better employee <laughs> knowing what I know now. Mm. But I was just, uh, yeah. I some of the strengths. I don't. So I don't have. I don't have. I don't have strengths in some areas. But now I recognise I do have strengths in some area, other areas. Mm. You know. So. Mm. So um, yeah. So I. But you want to get back to that moment that the Jenny. Yeah. The Jenny uh, Craig moment um, where I pulled the plug on everything. And I'd have to say that it wasn't just the work situation. The relationship played a big part of it. Mm. In fact, the relationship failing, I felt, was very, was very consequential. Right. And happening at the same time mm. was I just felt like I was making mistake after mistake. I was very, I felt very, um, yeah, insecure. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that the right word? I felt like, why am I keep making the same mistakes again? That's what it felt like. It felt like making mistakes in my personal life, making mistakes in my professional life. And that, um, look, I guess I had the, and, and I, I'm thinking about this in terms of advice for the people. I was lucky in that I had some savings because I've been working. I was a single guy, you know, so I put some money aside. Mm. So take three months off and live with mum. Mm. You know, it was definitely doable. <laughs> it was more than three months. <laughs> but, uh, but that but, was the plan. But, no, you've, you've got a good point because people... I'm always been thinking when I give advice, you know, as I do in my speeches, about am I telling what's really happened or what's really going on? You know, and there, I yeah. So I do feel like I was forced. The situation. I wish I love to say that I was had consciously decided to leave, and it was a considered decision. But I really, it was more of an explosion. It was more an explosion. I think. Yeah, I kind of think I could have. Yeah, I needed some time off. I really yeah. had to have some time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. And once you made that decision, yep. how did that change things for you? I mean, I, I mean, well, maybe from a kind of mental health and well-being point of view, how did that, that feel walking away well, from Well, um, <laughs> I'm trying to say, I would love to say fantastic. A bit of travel is great for getting perspective, right? So that's great. So I was away from the problem for a while as I was overseas. Then you come back and you're like, well, hang on, I've still got to get a job. What about my career? What am I going to do? And so I was trying to look out, okay, okay, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, started to read books about it. So I read What Colour Is My Parachute. Have you, you've heard of this book? Maybe. What Colour Is My Parachute. Very famous book because it's gone to like, I don't know, 20 different editions now. I was reading it around the eighth edition. Um, and it was, uh, it's just a way of, Stepping through this big choice <clears throat> about what what your job 
should be. I don't know why they call it like how does my parish parish? It's about how do you find a job for yourself? A job that you might feel and so there's tests in the book about mm. what your strengths are. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I read that, and one of the things it says is find someone who's doing the job that you want and ask them about it. I thought that's okay, okay, I can do that. You know, ideally you'd sort of follow them, show them for a day. Mm. <clears throat> you want to be in the HR consultant business, see all the glamour of working in a TV studio, that kind of thing. Uh, so the insight I had was you're not going to become a bear trapper in the Kamchatka Peninsula. You're going to be working in the corporate world. And when you're working in the corporate world, under fluorescent lights, looking out the window, what is it that you wish that you would have done so that you can be happy living in the corporate world, right? Because, yeah, at that point, perhaps I wasn't that happy. So if you want to live in, the, in a saucer under the Red Sea <clears throat> for three months, if that's, what's, if that's what you're going to be dream, uh, dreaming about when you're in the office, then why don't you do that? Why don't you sort of, why don't you, all those zombies are shuffling around in your head about what you thought your job was going to be like, your dream job. You thought you were going to be an actor or a musician or something like that. Then you go and, you know. And so I made a list of the, my dream jobs that I thought I'd had when I was 14. And one of them was being an adventurer. So I tell a lie before. I must have had that now because it was definitely on my list of, but I mean, that was, it's very idealized. It's very National Geographic Sunday special idea of adventure in my head. Everyone's very, it's, you don't suffer too much in my, in my <laughs> head adventures. Um, but that idea of exploring, like I like traveling. So that idea of exploring was going to be fantastic. Uh, making movies was another one. Like, um, uh, and so, and it's funny, in New Zealand, you can ask, you like, you can talk to people about this and they say, oh, my mate works in the ad agency, why don't you see him? Or so-and-so across the road, it's in the TV new, news, three news team or whatever, go and see them. It's amazing. So in short order, I found myself talking to people um, and it was about this time. So it was a very structured process. Because when people say, oh, I've run across the ocean, did the light bulb just go on? Because people love that narrative. It's a very compelling story to say, I didn't know what I was doing one day. And then one day, this happened to me, and I saw what my life was going to be like. It just did not happen at all. Mm. And I think the mistake was I was sort of waiting for that to try and happen. You have to, you have to make that moment and then tell the story later. <laughs> Once you've succeeded, then you can have as many light bulb moments as you like. But unfortunately, you've got to do quite a lot of work. Um, and so, like, editing. I quite liked editing films. I did it for holidays and things like that. I went and sat next to a TVNZ editor as he was editing. <clears throat> and it was dull, very tedious, frame by that kind of frame by frame stuff. And working on other people's stuff. You know, just in a dark room. Just didn't appeal to me. Um, but when it came to Explorer, it must have been about this time that um, there was a news clip on the TV about the transatlantic rowing race. And I thought, oh, okay, well, it's not, it's not, you know, maybe that's... And it was about this um, single woman. She would start off with her husband. The husband had pulled out and she had continued to the end. And so I thought, um, wow, uh, she can do that. Maybe I could... Maybe that's the thing I could do. That looks like adventure. And had been in the news because uh, Rob Hamill and Phil Stubbs had won the race. And so this was the, <laughs> the second race had just been held. Four years later, I think, the second race had just been held. And that had been a little bit controversial as well. There had been some Kiwi teams and they hadn't got along in that race. So it must have been in the news. And so uh, I thought, but hang on, about there's a clever thing about this thing. I don't think many people die doing this because... I think, it's, I think it's kind of safe. So you've got this, you have an adventure out in the ocean, it's kind of safe. So I went, I called up Rob Hamill, you know, contacted him by email, you know, super nervous to, to be contacting him because he's a, he's a, he's a TV star. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because I know Rob really well now. <laughs> but, uh, but it was super nerve-wracking to reach out to somebody you'd only seen on TV. And um, who, would, who would it be like? Who would it be like? It would be like calling up Haley Haley Holt for skateboarding advice, uh, yeah, for snowboarding advice or something. You know, 
Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah, you do. Uh, is that a good example? I don't know. You know. <laughs> uh, so he says, sure, let's meet up. And we had a chat. And the thing that got, uh, struck me most is, is how normal he was. Like, he was not that tall. He was not, doesn't, not a mountain of muscle, you know. He's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. He just seems like a normal person. Mm. Yeah, wait a minute. Shouldn't you be really different? Shouldn't you be... Like, I don't know, well, people who do these things, but they're all always six foot six bronze gods kind of thing, are they? I mean, and he looks really normal. And you think, well, if he can do it and he's normal, well, crikey, maybe I can do it. Uh, and then, yeah, I did some more research into the race, and uh, mothers and sons have done it. They don't, didn't, took them a long time, you know, but they got across the other side. Mm. So I started to think, well, maybe there was a sort of an adventure that I could do that wasn't going to, that was going to completely absorb me, right? So I was going to use all my skills and I could do it right. So not like half-assed like my jobs have been. And I, it was just going to get me straight on the back. You know, I was going to, something I could pour all of my energy into. And then, um, yeah, so I was thinking about the transatlantic race, but also I started to think about other things I could do as well. Like I've always had a fascination for the South Pole, for Antarctica, and read all of Scott and Shackleton and um, uh, the West Journey and the world and, and, and those books, and was just absolutely entranced by the idea of being in, in Antarctica. Um, and once those images get into your head, they really, they really uh, don't quieten down. They keep, they keep whispering away, like, wouldn't it be fantastic, wouldn't it be fantastic? Um, but it turns out going to Antarctica is really difficult, right? It's, it's, that's still the domain of people who have expertise. At least that's how it felt for me at the time. Now I know better. <laughs> uh, no, that's still quite hard. Uh, but, like I say, there were people who were not athletes taking part in the transatlantic rowing race. So I thought maybe I could do that too. I could do that. Yeah. And then it was later on I found it was actually quite risky and people who died. Mm. Yeah, but because didn't you? I, I remember reading this bit in the book, and I, I, was, I don't know whether it was intended that way. I think it was, but it was actually quite quite humorous to read because you were hoping that Rob was going to talk you out of it. Yes, and say, no, go on. It was. Yes, because it was, which I got the impression of gave me the impression that you weren't sure whether this was something you wanted to do. Yes, uh, and I need someone to tell me it's a bad idea. Yes, and then I can move on to the next thing. Yes, which seemed like a a thing that you were doing with crossing your yes. jobs off the list. So I could go back to being a bland worker. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I wanted to say, look, that's not for you, mate. It's not for you, really. Like if someone said, to, if, if you met an Olympic uh, uh, swimmer, you know, they could easily do that. They'd say, yeah, I just have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you have to devote your whole life to it. So, you know, and you, you could do, you'd walk away from that conversation easily not wanting to have anything to do with it. Yeah. And unfortunately, he didn't do quite a good job. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like... But it was it was already under my skin, yeah. I think I did a, I think I did a pretty good job in the book actually of representing that conversation, because mm. he was he's that's where he's saying, oh I said that's right I said to him tell me some bad things because he was a bit too upbeat. Mm. <laughs> he said oh you lose all the skin on your hands you're losing your ass. I said yeah thank you that's good that's just what I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. He says oh it's not that bad you can wear gloves. Um, <laughs> then he says oh but he says but then there's the risk of death, and I said and I said yeah. He says, well, that's got to keep you interested. I was like, yeah, it does. Actually, unfortunately, it does. <laughs> and I had this idea that it, it, this, I felt like to become an adult, to become a man, at some point, I had to pack my own parachute in the sense that take on risk and deal with it myself. Mm. So not don't throw myself off a building, but I wanted to have a, a situation that I was in that was risky if you didn't control the risk but I was going to control the risk using my resources and my intellect and manage the risk away and get through to the other side. And that was going to be a door that I had to pass through. And that was going to be really important for me. Mm. That's what I did. Mm. So, and I also thought that there was a chance to get sponsorship because there had to be a business case for this, right? Like I had, I had to live on something, right? So I thought it was kind of topical. It was kind of, was maybe... Um, Atlantic rowing was like the bungee jumping of the of the eighties, kind of. It was a little bit. It was topical. 
people and so people were interested in it. Companies, um, like Rob really struggled to get sponsorship for his first one. They had less; it was hard, but they were doable for the second one. I thought there was still possibly a chance we could just squeeze that juice a little bit more mm. uh, for the third one. Um, I think it'll be much harder now. Uh, yeah. So, and I thought the business side of things I could possibly do. I could handle. Doing, putting together a sponsorship pitch, that kind of thing. I so, so what, what what point did this idea, like you said, you know, once it gets in your in, in your mind, mm. um, you know, I don't know how much like the synchronicity type thing kind of plays a role. That once it's in your mind, everything seems to start to align, or mm. things you know fall on your path, or that kind of thing. But what point did it grab you so much that you wanted to do it? You've just said yourself, I think, earlier that. You didn't want to do it half-assed. Yeah, uh, very, clearly you did it. Very. So, oh no! At that stage, I could have possibly have just done it for the lifestyle and just got it across the other side. I mean, but as long as you know, and survived, and and I would have considered that you know, successful because I had had a wonderful experience. Yeah, and then got the other side. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, when did it become a thing? Well, the problem was you, you've read in the book also. I went and saw a sports coach, and to get who had. Had written, he had written training plans for the other Kiwi teams who'd been. You know, um, and so he asked me, Are you going to win or are you going to take part? Um, that was one of the first questions he asked me. And I said, I'm just going to take part. And he said, No, that's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a long conversation about that, about why you might want to win. And it's actually one of the most, I think it's one of the most interesting things I talk about in my speeches, I think that whole conversation I had with him, about why you might take on a challenge so big you might fail at it. And obviously, we don't mean fail as in death. I mean fail as in you might not get there in the time that you mm. gave yourself or whatever. Um, and uh, it's because, as he said, the best you can do is the best you can do, but you don't get the best out of yourself by trying hard. You've got to commit to a difficult goal. Like, yes, that's what I need to do. I need to commit to a difficult goal. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, I wanted, I, I, when I was working in the corporate world, the chaos of it all, I didn't, I didn't enjoy very much. Like I liked, the thing about working for yourself is that you uh, entirely get the consequences of the decisions that you make and the work you do. Mm-hmm. Um, we've already mentioned that luck can be a part of it and the economic cycle is also a big part of it too, but. But you don't get sent off on work that doesn't make any sense. You do it yourself. And so to have a project that I was going to be responsible for was going to, was something that, that I could control the elements of and was something that really appealed to me. Yeah. yeah. And so can you tell us a bit about that kind of preparation time? I mean, you weren't going to be doing this by yourself. You needed to find a, a rowing partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but you, like you said, you wanted to be in control of, of, of things. This was your yeah. idea. This is what you wanted to do. So how, how did you, what was involved in well, not necessarily. putting that together? I don't make a control. I had to control everything, but I wanted to, I was going to be part of the team that makes the choices. So I wasn't an expert. So I teamed up with, um, Rob wasn't keen to row a second time. This is Rob Hamill. Um, but he was keen to be involved in the management side of things because the raising the sponsorship is by far the hardest part. Mm. So it's the bit I don't talk about at all in my speeches because it's so dull. <laughs> you know, he wants to talk about the waves and the storms and the sharks and things like that. But 90% of the effort, and perhaps that was the best advice I got early on, was 90% of the effort was um, of the race is getting to the start line. Mm. Everyone who's at the start of the race is a winner. It is difficult, really difficult, mm. and lots of dreams die mm. on that road, on that way. Um, and so... I yeah, teamed up with Rob and uh, we started to chip away at that. He had lots of, uh, he had his um, contacts with the previous companies he'd, he'd sponsored him. So we could get in the front doors and give our pitch. But it was difficult this time because there were going to be two Kiwi teams in the race. There was this mm. team of two guys from Auckland who had won the previous time. So it often uh, felt like we'd walk in a door that they'd just walking out of. And, uh, and so... And they had all the experience. They had the track record as well. So, uh, and so, I don't, yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? But from a company's point of view, there's a guy who's an unknown, doesn't know 
how to row. And then there's Rob, who's obviously very experienced, but he's not rowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were not perhaps the most compelling, compelling team in the, in the end. Um, yeah, in the meantime, and so the, um, as part of that, we were trying to find the other rowing partner as well, which I thought would be easy. But it's actually surprisingly difficult to find people who want to take months off work <laughs> to do the transfer <laughs> to grow. Because I thought it was a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you, you asked the question. I think you slowly get drawn into it about when do you know, when have you made this point of last return? You know, once you pay the um, the race fees, you know, that was like $30,000 or something. Right. Pretty much into it. I don't think we pay them. Maybe you pay them in installments. So we paid $10,000 or something like that. That was mm. quite a big deal. And then you have to get the you pay to get the boat was shipped out as a flat pack, so it had to be made made up here. Really, nothing at all. Started from scratch. So how we did? Um, yeah. So, so but slowly you get pulled in into it. Mm. You know, mum, my mum, who was always a, a fountain of advice to me, said of lots of very <laughs> pertinent things like Kevin, you're going to see in a coffin. And she was very clever because she knew the way to stall me was by uh, was to get me to think, am I doing the best thing? Like if you want adventure, why don't you do something that hasn't been done before? Why, why are you doing people right across the ocean? Do something else. Why don't you do something that hasn't been done? She's very clever. Yeah. And that was the thing that almost stopped me. I was like, you know, around the ocean has been done. If you could do anything, someone gave you two years and a certain amount of money, why would you do something that's already been done? Why don't you do something else? Why would you? Uh, so she nearly stopped me that way. But then I realised that at some point, you don't want to be the, the story of the donkey caught between the, whatever, the, the hay and the carrots, right? You've got to make a decision. You've got to do a decision, even if it's only a 90% decision. Doing nothing is a terrible decision. You've got to make some mistakes. So um, I want to cut a long story short and get to the end of the race. But I think the interesting thing was, from a career point of view, is where did I think all this was heading? <laughs> mm. And sure enough, I came back and now what do I do? I work for my dad. Dad has a small plastics company. And I worked with him for a year. Um, long enough to learn that I probably it's difficult working in a, for your father <laughs> um, and then I went through a series of situations where people asked me to help out like my coach asked me to help him out with his company he was he was trying to create this um, uh, take all his learnings in his brain about how to write uh, and adapt training plans and turned it into a piece of software. So as you, that would sit on your iPhone. So when you, you you type in what you're trying to achieve and it would give you a plan and then depending on what you actually did, it would change the plan. Uh, so it sounds really, it sounds bizarrely simple now, but at the time it was years ahead of its time because iPhones were pretty clunky. Um, but at the moment, every time I go for a run now, I'm like, am I doing the smartest thing? Like. What am I trying to do? If I'm trying to get fit, just doing the same run around the block doesn't work that well. You've got to do other things. If, you're, if I'm training for a half uh, marathon, then again, running around the block is probably not a great idea. And I couldn't do that run I was supposed to do last week. So how does it change for the fact they haven't you know, to the achiever? Anyway, his company, was he was just starting out on that company. And he asked me um, to help him out. So I did that for a few months. And then I had another one of those moments that you talk about where I grabbed fate by the neck. No, I didn't. My wife said we have to go to, <laughs> to England. Um, if we actually, we, because of her medical training, we had to live in Brisbane for a year. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? Well, I go to Brisbane for a year. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and that was when I wrote the book mm. um, and started to speak, which is very odd. So, in the year or two after, um, in the year or two 
after finishing the rowing uh, race, I'd been approached by a couple of companies to speak. Just like after the Olympics, you know, people who in the Olympics tend to get on the speaking circuit for a little bit. Um, I was asked to speak, and it was a horrible stretch for me because I have a stutter. And so to get up in front of an audience and talk was incredibly challenging. A very a nerve-wracking experience. Um, and but it paid quite well. <laughs> right. Yeah. I might have like paid $1,500 for a speech, mm. which seemed like absolute gold at the time. And so to do that four times a year, so it wasn't, it definitely wasn't, a job, but occasion. But I got onto the books of the speaking agency, and occasionally, mm. I don't think they've put me forward. But if somebody asked for me, <laughs> then then maybe I was put forward. Yeah. Um, I'd do a speech, and uh, people liked it a little bit when I talked about it. Mm. Yeah. And so, though, I had. Done some speaking, public speaking, as part of Toast, uh, part of Toastmasters, so that was all right. so that was something. But then, um, but then to come and then to, to, to talk in corporates was really yeah. was uh, a next step up. Yeah. But that was still years before I was starting to do it full time. Yeah. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors. I'm really pleased to announce that we have Sharp New Zealand as a sponsor, and it's great to have Sharp on board because as a customer, I can speak about their products and services from personal experience. And it feels good to be able to endorse and recommend a company because of the level of satisfaction we have regarding the services they provide. And across my businesses, we've certainly been impressed with the care and collaboration we've experienced in our dealings with Sharp. It's certainly a brand that we trust. Sharp has a long history of creating breakthrough products designed to meet the needs of people living in New Zealand. Sharp's leadership in technology innovation ensures it's at the forefront of the pack, providing business solutions from printing and photocopying to interactive meeting solutions and ICT phone systems. No matter where you are or what size your organization, whether you're large or small, Sharp New Zealand can provide their services to you nationwide. If you're looking to upgrade your technology or renew your photocopier leases, talk to your local Sharp team or visit the website at sharp.net.nz. So, if I can, Kevin, I'm going to come back to the, the speaking thing. Yeah, I, I, just, I want to zip back in time. I know you kind of cut a long story short and got to the end and moved on from the race itself. And I, and I don't want to go into detail about the race because I think that's what you do in your speeches. And, sure. you know, make it's not really about life and work either. Yeah, but it's, it's like I, I'm sure that there are, I know from... What you what you do work wise, um, there's, a, there's a lot of correlation between what happened in that um, that, that journey to work and life that you yeah. apply. And, and so I don't want to kind of, from a commercial point of view, it doesn't make sense to spell all that out now. And obviously, it's in the book as well, so people can can access that. But what I did want to ask was, um, going through that um, that that journey. Which took how, how long did it take? Forty days. Yeah. yeah. What did you learn about yourself that you didn't know before that you've kind of taken forward from that time? You, you know, when you said skip, you know, skip to the end, and, and then and then what? Uh, you know, the, the then what bit? You know, what were you taking forward after that? You know, what did you learn about yourself and about, I suppose, even human nature that that you know when when Kevin got back from that trip, from that, um, that achievement, how, how were you different? Does that make, make sense? Yeah, I struggle with the question though. Like, I, I do, um, I don't think, I wish there was a revelation. What did you learn about yourself? I don't know, I don't know. I didn't feel any different at the end than I did at the start. A lot of work had gone into the preparation. I felt lucky, I guess, at the end. <laughs> That's what I felt lucky. I got there. Uh, I mean, as I said, I've said 90% of the races to get to the start. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to the start line, 
you've spent nights at sea, so to spend nights at sea is not such a big deal. You know, you've eaten the food, you've been on the boat, you've lived on the boat. Mm. The race itself it just has to go according to plan. That's all you want, right? That's, so I guess I learned that you can push through fatigue. I mean, you can in, in a, but in a very limited way. You know, you can keep on producing output. Mm. Um, I suppose. Um, look, I look. I think a lot of things. I don't know. A lot of things. I was lucky in, in a sense. Yeah, we had a pretty good year. We didn't have. St we had storms, but not storms that slowed us down for weeks at a time, like other boats don't. We, other teams dealt with sharks and things like that. We didn't get to meet many sharks. If any, we got capsized and thrown out of the boat. <laughs> I suppose I, can't, I, don't know, I shouldn't say it was too easy, but um, but thank God we, didn't, we got back on. Uh, but mostly just felt lucky. Felt yeah, I felt pleased that we had pulled it off. But I had this, you know, you talk, I had more of a chance to reflect towards the end of the South Pole trek because we had a long time to think as we walked the last week to the pole about what we had achieved you know, or what I hadn't achieved, what I had learned about myself. And I really couldn't find anything. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't. So, so, I guess here's what I came up with. Yeah. I'm not the sort of person who can't do them, these adventures. Mm. There must be some people who can't do them. Yeah. I'm not that person. Mm. But... Tis then, tis, but then I haven't come back and become a fabulously successful. Don't know. What yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I'm in my mind. I'm thinking about your earlier comments about self, self doubt and self confidence. Yeah, um, you're right. It gave me a lot did, more. I was going to say, you know, that sense of achievement. Did that do something yes. to that? It did. Yeah. It did. It did. I had packed that parachute and I had jumped and I had survived mm -hmm. and. I know that there's not much to run across the Atlantic, but nobody else seems to know. <laughs> and so people quite like to hear about it. Um, do you know, I don't know whether you, you doubt whether you're fit or where you should, you know, maybe there's guys in their 50s and stuff like that who wish that they had run a marathon or anything like that. I'm not that, I don't have to worry about that anymore. That one's sorted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've done yeah, it. Done that. From, from a physical point of view, I've proven myself, mm. I feel. Mm. And that's really, I guess that's, I guess that's a good thing to say. Is that of, yeah. No, you're right. You're right, and I didn't learn anything about myself, but I did kill some demons. Hmm. I think that's the right way of putting it. Yeah, I'd be well, a, less, a much less satisfied about. person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If I hadn't done. And so going forward, if I can go to back to what you were talking about, um, the, the speech side of things, the speaking yeah. side of things, because I mean, am I right in saying that since since you did the, um, yeah. the transatlantic, that's Apart from obviously writing the book and other adventures and, and TV that you've been involved in, yes. the speaking thing it's has been a big part of yes. your career, yes. hasn't it? Since yes. then, right? the last four or five years. Well, I've spoken yeah, professionally since 2003, and this is um, yeah, 2023, so we've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot since 2010. So it's my full time job since 2010. Right, right. Um, but then, so it did take me seven years to build up the speaking to a point where I could quit my job. And I didn't quit my job. I'm just saying that because I'd love it to say that, you know, there were times where I grabbed hold of my life, um, but often things were forced upon me. Like I say, I was forced to go overseas, forced to go to, to live in Brisbane for a year, which is kind of wasn't long enough to get a job. I guess I suppose I could have got a, a job, but the speaking was coming. Now I had to rely solely on speaking. So I worked very hard to, to do speaking over there. Um, and made it into a reasonable number of speeches in Australia. And then for some reason, speaking kicked off back here. Mm -hmm. So I was flung back a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, they happened the same thing. A year later, we had to spend six months in Newcastle in the UK. And for some reason, being out of the country, <laughs> I, I did a lot of speaking. So yeah, yeah. it was great. Yeah. Right. And, and so you, you've talked about having a stutter as, uh, as a child and, yeah. you know, you could think, you know, rightly so, I suppose, people could have fear about going into um, speaking in public yep. in front of people. Yep. Um, yep. How, how did you yep. manage that? Yep. How did you, you get know, over you that? Know, I feel like we are, both you and I are trying to find um, little nuggets of gold which we can share with people who might be in similar situations. And I feel like I have stumbled and bumbled through life a little bit and things have happened. Uh, 
to me, but the stuttering and dealing with that is something that I do feel that I have taken life by the throat and actually mm. done something about. So it's this, actually, it's this, oddly, it's the thing I'm the most proud about. And I've only just started talking about it now right. in speeches just this last year. For the last few years, I've mentioned it at the very start of the presentation. Okay. I used to try and pass myself off as a fluent person. And some of the time I can get away with it. <laughs> but then some of the time I don't. Mm. I have a big block on stage. Uh, and people were, people were looking at me a bit strangely. Um, a, a, at one point a few years ago, I had someone come up to me and say, I just want to check you're okay because I thought you were having a stroke. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's where I thought, you know, you really need to let the audience in on this. Mm. But I didn't think, I thought no one's going to employ me if they know I have a stutter. And it's certainly not on my website. I wouldn't do it. Um, but gradually over time, you realise it's part of the story. Mm. Very, very, just every so often, like, I'm st like I was much, much less self-conscious of it now than I was when I was at school, but I'm still self-conscious about it. But I still have a, uh, um, recently I was, a guy called me up and said, I want you to come and speak to my team. And I said, uh, just, just let you know, I have a stutter. He says, I know you have a stutter. I have, I've heard you speak. He says, that's why I want you to talk. Because I want them to see someone who's living it. I want, yeah. like, whoa, whoa, that's really interesting. Because yeah, yeah. I thought it's nothing. There's nothing good about not being able to say what you want to say when you want to say it. Mm. Maybe the world is more appreciative of div diversity now, um, so we're not looking for that super slick motivational speaker. Um, but uh, yeah, so so now I am. Uh, it's I don't feel self-conscious about it at all. In fact, soon I'll be at the point where I won't be charging more for stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, 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 never yet, there yet. But I have tried in a couple of speeches at the end of the presentation talking about it a little bit mm. because it's part of this question about what are you going to do next? And I don't like that question because they're trying to other me. You are different, right? So it's what I'm trying to do to Rob Hamill when I first met him. Mm. Please for God's sake, be different from me because I don't want to have the responsibility of being able to take on a big challenge. I just want to sit in my quiet life. Mm. So I want, but but I love hearing about your, what you're doing. Oh, you go kill, you go kill yourself. You have fun doing this crazy stuff. But thank God you're not like me. And so, or else it's a pity question because no one else is asking anything. It's kind of the obvious one. Uh, so, but I try and say to them, this isn't about me. You've been listening to me for an hour now. What are you going to do? Um, and but if people do insist on wanting to know what's next, then I can say, look, I do. I try to preempt the question in question time. I say, here's a question that you're you're too kind to ask about, which is, you know, how did someone with a stutter become a public speaker? Type of and so I can talk about the process that I went through because I think everybody has something. Mm. Everybody has a limit that they've put on themselves. They said they, you know, they, they can't do it. Yeah. I have a fear of this, or a fear of that, or a fear of heights, or I'm not good. I'm not very social. You know, I'm not that charming. Look at that person; they can dance or whatever. You know, we always have. You know, I can't lose weight. There is always something that everybody has. I was astonished when I was at school. We did speech competition in English class. That there were other kids, fluent kids, who were more nervous than me about speaking. And I'm like, that isn't right. You know you're going to be fine. You know, you know it. Yeah. I would give anything to be you. Uh, and you're never, why are you being nervous? You know, that makes no sense whatsoever. I've got real good reason because <laughs> I know it's going to be a train wreck. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, yeah, I really, uh, so I, um, I do think, again, I don't want to talk about the stutter because it's talking about me. I wanted to talk about it because it's, I think it's very odd to have, and there's not many people who have a, who are a public speaker who stutter. Yes. Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And you can recognize it in some of his speeches. But very, but very few people. And so I, um, if I can do that, and everyone, I don't have, again, because there's people who deal with very difficult stutters, right? And it's not, I'm fortunate in that I've been able to work on it and reduce reduce the starter. For some people, that's not an option. But but I it's, I think it's still a valid point to say that people put self-constraints on themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can push those back quite a bit. They're not what you think. 
they are. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Do you, am I on yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, absolutely. I, I think everyone's got something. You said that. Right? Every, every, everyone's got something that constrains them or makes them feel like they can't do something. Mm. Um, and we've all got challenges. And for us, they're all big challenges. But then when you compare them to someone else, maybe not quite so much. But they're still kind of constraining or debilitating in some kind of way yeah. that prevents us from being who we might want to be or yes. who we can be. Yes. So I think it's important to have conversations about those kind of things, if people are happy to, of course, um, about the fact that you can overcome challenges yep. and that it doesn't stop you uh, yes. from, from doing things that, that you're great at yep. and that, that you can make a career out of yep. and enjoy doing. Yes. And, and then obviously tell your stories that are empowering other people. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I think so. that's, I mean, you know, you said it's one of the things that you're, if not the most proudest about. Yes. Is that, because it would have been very easy for me. I've had a lot of terrible moments. <laughs> I've died on stage. Not necessarily when I'm, my public speaking, uh, not, uh, as a paid public speaker, but it was a Toastmaster. Oh, God. Terrible. Really dis I didn't have the tools then. I didn't know what to do. I've suffered a lot and I've had to keep pushing myself into the fear, keep exposing myself into the fear. And it started off, I mean, my first Toastmasters club, there were six people there and it was just terrifying to go in front of them. Mm. But then after a few months, you know them all, so it's not scary. So then you have to go to another club where it's scary. Again, you know? And I've yeah. slowly and slowly and slowly over 20 or 30 years, but methodically and with with purpose, I have pushed the limits, keep pushing the limits back and back and back. And so I think there's something to be taken away from that. I do, Absolutely. I do like that. I like that thing. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the that's the critical or the key point, isn't it? It's keep pushing and keep stretching because you, you stretch so far and then that becomes yeah. your comfort zone. And yeah. then, you know, the growth is in getting out of your comfort zone, isn't it? And moving yes. to the next club where you don't yes. know people and – facing your fears yeah. and you, like you said, you died on stage or in front yeah. of those people, but it didn't stop you going back and doing it again. Yes. And, and it can so easily, The uh, you know, I know this myself as well, you know, working in, in the roles that I've had, you can have a, an off workshop day. workshop that goes bad. You can, yeah, you can have an off day yeah. for a variety of different reasons. And that can be, you know, you can feel a little bit sick inside and it can put you off and then you're a bit more nervous the next time. Yeah. But you've got to kind of pick yourself up and... Yeah. And try and learn from that. Yeah, learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I can, I am conscious of the time, um, Kevin, but I, I'd like to touch on um, the South Pole. Oh, yeah, great. Um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about about how that came about. Because in, in my mind, from what I've read and what I've heard, yeah. what you said to me before, there are little touch points. And you talked about you know, this book that you're thinking about writing, about the influence of of the sort of outside world on, on us. Um, you know, you mentioned Sir yeah. Ed, you went to um, overseas yeah. at school, you know, those kind of things and the books you were reading, you know, culminated in this opportunity for you to go to, I yes. say opportunity, but yeah. you've created it. Opportunity. You've yeah. created it. <clears throat> um, I, I'm really interested in how that came about. Yes. Um, uh, and what drove you to, to well, go do that. Yes. Well, uh, so... After I came back from the transatlantic race, I had had this extraordinary experience of meeting Jamie, my teammate, who we had met just before the start of the race because he filled in at the last minute. But we got on very, very well. And so we actually ended up getting a flat together. He was working at the ANZ at the time, the graduate scheme. Um, I was working at Telecom. So I came back home, worked at Telecom. Um, uh, and... Uh, and so we both would, we both tried hard to make a, 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 you know, a go in the corporate world again, give the corporate world a second chance. And I um, just wasn't working for me again. <laughs> just wasn't there. I, you know, it's not until I'm talking to you now that I realise that there's, you know, I really should have learned that lesson beforehand. <laughs> but, you know, you need to get paid. You just need, you need to get paid. And so I had to do something. Jamie also was finding the work in the bank not being quite what he was hoping it would be. And we started thinking, you know, I guess for both, for me, I'd always thought the South Pole was the domain of very experienced mountaineers. And, and there are private, there is a one private company that does 
flights to the edge of Antarctica, mostly to support people who climb Mount uh, Vincent, the highest mountain in Antarctica. But they also uh, provide the logistics and the search and rescue support for teams going to the South Pole. And there had been at that point like 45 people had walked solo to the South Pole. Like that's a relatively recently thing. So uh, there was Scott and Amudzin in 1912. Stradman Hillary was there in 1956, 58. And he was only the third person to lead a team overland to the South Pole. And then very, very few people led teams to the South Pole until about 1990. And that's when it became possible for a private company to fly a plane down to Antarctica. And then only a handful of teams would do it every year or every other year or something like that. Like I say, because there's, there's stats about solo unsupported treks to the South Pole. Mm-hmm. And so because we've had an experience with the um, Antarctic, uh, with the, with the uh, transatlantic, then I thought, maybe I can learn the skills. It's, not, it's just a question of, yeah, I can learn. You know, I guess I had the growth mindset now. I thought I could never be that skilled to learn. I thought, no, I can learn. It's not that bad. It turns out you can learn. Uh, and in some respects, it's easier because, uh, y- yeah, that's, you can buy a lot of the clothes off the shelf. You can buy the, the, the things you need uh, are not uncommon in the, those parts of the world that are really cold, like Canada. And so we went there, learned um, how to, to, to um, trek and look after ourselves in the cold. And then, uh, yeah, that was tremendously exciting to be in this place of those heroes of the golden age. Mm-hmm. You know? And you know, unfortunately, you'd, what you would really want to do, ideally, is sleep in Scott's bunk that night and then take off the next day. But mm-hmm. he, he <laughs> it's very hard to get to Scott Base if you're a private person. So we start on the South American side. Which is completely. You, I mean, it's possible, but you just have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars because they've got to fly a plane right. over. And yeah. Every all the fuel has to be flown down, and then they have to do fuel dumps. It's just a nightmare to, mm. to organize. People have done it. I don't know, one or two people have done it. But um, you'd want to start off in Scott's, Scott's house and head towards uh, Scott's hut rather than head towards the South Pole. But that's actually quite a long way to go. To you start in the South Pole side, it's only 1,200 k's to the South Pole. And then, uh, yeah, what would you like to know? Uh, well, okay, so I've got a question then about, you know, these things seem like a good idea and uh, yeah. at the time, and then when you're in it yeah. and you're actually there yeah. and it's as hard as it, yes. as, as you've described yes. previously, is, is there a moment of, what the hell did I think of? Oh, gosh, yes. More, so much. So much. Did you, you know, if Really if, scared. Yeah. Really scared. Okay. Yeah. When the plane flies away. And you're like, which way is south? Yeah. Which is not a trivial question, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, not yeah. obvious when, yeah. when you're there. Yeah. Because the sun is doing um, a circle above your head. Mm. The compass points well off the coast. Yeah. The GPS will tell you which way is south, but only when you're moving and it goes flat really quickly. Mm. Um, because the cold's so intense. So you've got to get that sorted out. Yeah. It's... it's um, those first few days, and the cold is incredibly intense. Yeah. Uh, we, I trained in intense cold, but this was this was really. I was going to say, can you really train for for these? Yeah, it gets things? cold up in Canada. But I mean, yeah. is, I'd it, say is it is it's it colder once you once you've done your training and then you go there? Is it like, yeah, that's similar, or actually, this is way worse? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking both uh, of the yeah, transatlantic was, as um, well. It was the numbers would say that they were the same, but it was. It was just nasty. It was windy. So it was as cold wherever it was when we first started out. Mm. Minus 20, I think. But it was windy. Um, it's very unforgiving, that cold. Like if you drop a glove or if something goes wrong or you mm. can't. I, I liken it a lot to scuba diving. Like scuba diving, when things are going well, it's fantastic. Mm. But then a little something goes wrong. You get a bit of water in, yeah. in your mask and you get a bit dis, a little bit disorientated or something. And very quickly, you know, yeah. spiral out of control. So yeah, yeah. that's... I'm it's smiling because I've, I've I've been there, done that. Yeah. What's that, sorry? I said I'm smiling because yeah, I, I, I've been there, done that. You got a little, <laughs> yeah. a bit nervous. Yeah. So it was, yeah. it was exactly like that. As long as everything was fine, you know, and everything was fitted and your gloves were warm and stuff like that, then you're fine. Mm. But um, often with this, yeah, but then that doesn't happen. You've got to take off your gloves because you have to undo your zip to get your chocolate out. Mm. And then, you know, mm. Lots of things can go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was actually very painful. Much, much, much harder. 
right. some paper ones. When you when you do these things, that's, that's two huge adventures. Like you say, the South Pole is not something that there's only a handful of people have done what you did there. Mm. It, is there an element of um, you know, you're glad that's over? You never want to uh, be there again, or is there a, you know is it is there something in you that says oh, I could do that again? How far from it? Well, it's funny you say that because Jamie said to me after we came back from the South Pole. I think we're probably still in Antarctica. He said, if any of us, if either of us start talking crazy talk about doing this again, we'll give the other one an uppercut. <laughs> because he knew that it's so easy to gloss over and to forget the painful bits yeah. and to romanticize what a wonderful trip yeah. you had. Mm. And then before you know it. Yeah. There was a there was a Spanish crew in the transatlantic race who arrived the day before the race start. And like he had been in the race the previous time. Four years earlier, I think, two years earlier. And he had, uh, had the boat had been at the bottom of his garden, and then he decided, you know what, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. It's fine. And he drove up through Spain, caught the ferry out, got to us at the Canary Islands, uh, hopped on his boat. Two days into the race, he called up a support yacht and said, come and take me off. It's all coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and he was taken off the boat. I mean, right. like, yeah. Two or three days in, because he could remember. Now he was remembering what it was yeah, like to be yeah, on the yeah, boat. Yeah, and I, I, I think of that guy quite a lot when I do think about going back. But look, even in Antarctica, I felt it. It, it I wanted to keep going. You know, it just it felt fantastic. Mm. Mm. Um, when you get to the to the the South Pole, it's often the weather is very fine. It's cold, but relatively still. There's no wind. And the snow is beautiful, sugar kind right. of snow. So not you don't like it to be hard, hard ice, but it's mm. it's not it's not that, but it's not bad for making you. You don't have to walk around um, ice features all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not bad. So you actually you can quite enjoy the last few days. Right. Yeah. And what what does it feel like? I mean, we've all you know. Hopefully, everyone's had some sense of achievement in their lives and gets a shot of dopamine. But what's doing something like that? Like you say, with a Heroes of the Golden Era, there's only a handful of people have done it, yeah. and you've worked so hard. It's 1,200 yeah. 1200 kilometers. Yeah, 1,200 kilometers. You know, you've, you've taken so much, so many risks, and then you've done it. What does that, is it just relief, or is it kind of? It's a lot of relief. It's an extraordinary feeling. You just feel like a million dollars. I haven't done cocaine, but it must be like that. It must be like, I can do anything. <laughs> yeah. That's a, if I can do that, I can do anything. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And it lasts for, you know, a few days. Yeah. Nearly a week. <laughs> <laughs> Before you're like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is an amazing feeling at the time. It really is a sensational feeling of being able to take on anything. Mm. I do. I do miss that. It's worth getting back to. Yeah. So what well, you, you point there about it lasting a week, it's a nice kind of segue into, into another question I've got about... You know, doing that kind of thing is not normal, as we've just said. There's a, there's a, only a handful of people that have done it. It's not typical everyone goes out and does that. So it's it's extraordinary, and it's an extraordinary achievement. And then you go back to a kind of normal life. You know, I beg to differ, you see. If it was extraordinary, yeah. then how come I did it? Maybe uh, you're see extraordinary. That, <laughs> see that, but I know I'm not. <laughs> Therefore... I don't think that's... You don't think that going to the South Pole is extraordinary? No. No, I don't. Right. No. Um, uh, you, people go to the South Pole, they get... Uh, uh, you can do it as a tourist, a, a trip that we did, but you get resupplied. Mm. And the weight of your sled is, an, is the biggest factor. It's the what causes you all the pain. If you had a light sled uh, and you're moving fast and have a lot... You can eat and you don't worry about fuel. You can have a reasonably pleasant time of it. No, you'd still, you'd still suffer. <laughs> you'd, still, you'd still suffer. But um, when your sleds are back-breaking heavy, and, yeah, and you'd, you'd also go fast because you'd have a lighter sled. Mm. So you, you, the, the question, uh, uh, lots of people could walk un, uh, resupplied to the South Pole. That's, right. Anybody could row across the Atlantic. We could put you in the rowboat right now and you would get to the other side. It would take 100 days maybe. Mm. 
but the wind and the currents go that way. Mm-hmm. So I do feel it does, f- yeah, so I don't feel extraordinary. I don't feel extraordinary. Um, edit that bit out and just put the bit about me being extraordinary because <laughs> I don't know, I shouldn't say that. But you know, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that you know, like there's there's a there's a high there, isn't there, of, of achievement? You've worked towards something. These things take time. Yep. You know, maybe years in the planning. Yep. Um, yep. All yeah. All that. No, people have better things. And, and then, but then you know, you you go back to a, a normal life. Is is that? You know, I'm thinking about the kind of highs and lows of everybody's life. Are your highs and lows any different as a result of doing those kind of things? Do you? Yeah, I think I'm look, I'm much more happy and I'm more contented as a person now, I think, definitely. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no there are fewer demons to to slay. But but you get the same feeling coming back from a camping trip. Almost exactly the same feeling, right? You go away for a weekend and you do with do with without a few things and you come home, and you go, Oh wow, beds are cool. Mm. You know, toast is a fantastic mm. thing. You know, oh, I've really enjoyed that beer. It's great yeah. to put your feet up. Yeah. So it's it's a very similar feeling. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I do, people get starry-eyed about the adventures because the photos are good, you know? <laughs> and it's hard to take photos of here's me and my startup business or here's me making my way in my career. That doesn't make quite good photos, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's this, I do feel like it's the same journey, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Am I wrong? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's, right. no, it's interesting to hear you say that. Yeah, you know, I, it's not, probably not the answer I would have expected. Yeah. So it's interesting that you you see things that way. That's an yes. interesting perspective. Because I really am the office worker who did these things. I'm not the child Olympian, do you know, who yes, yeah. who was always dedicated and always had the supernatural commitment mm. and perseverance. Mm. Yeah, I was somebody who who had a normal life and then did them. Mm. Kind of went back to a normal life, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, Kevin, what's, I, I, I know you've mentioned earlier about people asking you what's next, and I'm not necessarily talking about your adventures here. You're still a, a young man, um, and I can say that because I think we're about the same age. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very young man. Then. We're very young man. Um, you know, you've got a, got a lot of life ahead of you, and what, what are your thoughts on... You know what's what does the future look like for you? What's the what's your, I mean? You've already got a legacy, right? You've already achieved yeah. things, uh, albeit not necessarily extraordinary as you would say. But I, I, I still yeah would argue differently because you know in that you did the cross um, the transatlantic, you won the race, and didn't yes. you do it in a record time as yes. well? Yes, you know you've got a, you've got world records. Yeah. I don't know if they're still world world records or not. Yeah, no, um, they've been broken, but that's what happens. But that's what that's what yeah. they're there for, yeah. right? That's right. Um, you know, and, and obviously going to the South Pole, like you say, without without being resupplied and things like that, is a you know, extra special achievement. Um, you're a family man now. I mm. um, know you've got a great career on the speaker circuit, and you're going out and educating people and sharing your stories and your wisdom with people. Um, is is there anything else that you you know if you if you look forward, is there something that you're looking forward to doing, um, traveling more, or I, I don't know, what does the future hold for you? I uh, am a turmoil of frustration about the projects that are not being done at the moment. You know, I have um, I have some great ideas for things that I'd love to do. I have I have books. I'd love to get back to doing to write more. I get wonderful uh, compliments about the book, and I and I, though I suffered greatly, I'd like to I'd like to do more because I do enjoy the process of. Um, uh, reading, so, and yeah, it doesn't really make sense. I like, to, I, I I can slope in that book up, read it, and laugh. Mm. And I'm like, if you can laugh at your own stuff, that's that's <laughs> yeah, pretty that's good. Pretty good. Yeah. So I'm not sick of it, so that's good. Yeah. And I want to do. I need that have experience again. So I've got a couple of books I'd I'd love to read. I really think this book about. So I'm trying to write a book of it. It started off with this idea of this book of advice for my son. And then I thought. There's sort of there's a bit about growing up in the 70s and 80s as well, and then this. But the really interesting thing is about the two more interesting parts about uh, the extent to which our lives are affected by factors beyond our control. 
Like we tend to, to, to think we're masters of our destiny, but we are only to a point. And it's interesting to reflect on, yeah, I think. And the other thing is uh, predicting the future. If you're so good at looking at the past and things like that, then you should be able to say. And there's some things you can. I did an exercise when I was at Telecom. They asked me to essentially predict the world 10 years' time. And that was more than 10 years ago. And I'm surprised how many things just come came right. There are some things that are just straight lines. You know, you can... Mm. If you're paying four dollars fifty for a flat, a flat white now, you can there will be you can almost say the date you'll be paying eleven dollars for a flat white. As insane as it sounds, mm. you, know, you can predict mm. that day it's going to happen. Um, so uh, I think it would be fun to look predict. So have a book that's a, a mem, almost a mem, a memoir of what it's like to be a kid uh, with advice. I don't know. Uh, that's all than that thought. Another book about when to quit. When to quit. That's a fascinating topic, really fascinating topic. I, I have a big problem with the advice industry in which people tend to give terrible, conflicting advice from the stage. I, I just, I, it makes my teeth hurt when I listen to it. I've heard people say, um, but look, basically the, 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 the test is if the opposite of the advice is uh, true, then the advice you're hearing isn't very good. Mm. Like I've heard some people say, you need to focus on the de details, the details. You know, you need to focus, uh, like if you're on a training for a marathon, you should be, you know, taking the raisins out of your cereal and just eating the right stuff. You should be cutting your shoelaces in half because that's extra weight. But you also hear someone say, we've got to focus on the big picture. The problem with you, you're not focusing on the big picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to advice about perseverance, we can get told you should persevere. It's all about perseverance. It's all about getting it through it. You've got to get to the end. Mm -hmm. Quit is never win. Win is never quit. But then we're also told that uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting something different Yeah, yeah. to happen. And I just, I have... In my, I have a draft advice manifesto that I want every motivational speaker to sign off on. But that's probably one of the things, mm. is don't give advice that the opposite is also true. And that's very true for when to quit. And I have an idea about how to solve it. Right. I, think I, I think I know when. I can tell you when to quit. Okay. Um, or at least give you a framework for when to quit, yeah, yeah. which I think is quite interesting. All right. But it's taken me so long to write the book, to think about the book, that someone has actually come out with a book called When to Quit. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? There's, same, no, humor, the same, yeah. there's no humor in the book. You'd expect right. at page 10 for her to say, is it time for you to stop stop reading that? <laughs> Never said it. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so. so, yeah, just because it's already been done doesn't mean to say it can't be I done better. I think right? there's still space in the market. I think yeah. it's a... It's a very good, very good. I, I have got just one last thing I want to run past you. Sure. That's all right. Um, yeah, very quickly, yes. Yeah. We've got plenty of time. Um, and I, and I, took it from, I took it from your book, and I just wondered whether you had any thoughts. So these are questions that you kind of asked, were asking yourself uh, quite early in the, in the book, I think, or asking yourself early in life, earlier in life, but it was early in the book too. Um, and I just wondered whether this has been, a, you've had any more thoughts on this stuff um, or any clarity or <laughs> words of wisdom. There were three questions. Uh, you turned them, you were looking for answers to big questions. What is life about? <laughs> what are we here for? And how do I make myself happy? Did I say that in the book? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I, and I just wondered whether you had any That's thoughts so on, on those. That's a so good question. Oh. Well, what's life about? I don't think, oh my word, that's really tough. It is. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I am, look, I'm much happier now than I was when I was going through that. And, and I think I wonder whether the part of it is, my mother always said to me, Kevin, what you need to do is get married down, settle to get a nice girl and have some kids. And I'm, um, and I wonder if there wasn't something to that. <laughs> <laughs> so having a happy marriage and two gorgeous boys has brought so much.
joy to my life. Yep. So much joy. Mm. Um, and spending time with them is, is uh, mm. really special. Yep. So that has been a large part of my happiness. But I don't, 20, you can, you're going to tell that to 24 year old Kevin? Hey, Kev, yeah, settle yeah. down. Have a good, no, that's, that's true. I think if you're in your mid 30s, I don't know. I look, any, it's going to be different for everybody, isn't it? But it's, yeah. there'll be a time. There's yeah. a time when it's right for you to yeah. do it. I don't know. I'm very glad. I was not. I was not marriageable. I think until I was forty, unfortunately, because of this, these things I had to do and get done. Yeah. yeah. And then, and the zombies, the demons. The zombies, the demons had to be knock killed. Off. And then, thank God, thank God, it all worked out. I was yeah. very, I'm very lucky. Yeah. God, imagine if things hadn't worked out. It could just so easily not be here. There's plenty of multiple universes out there where there is Kevin's wandering around, banging into walls, very upset with themselves, and things just didn't work out. This was the one lucky universe that things did work out. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any particular meaning to life, but why doesn't that matter so much now? It used to be a big deal. I used to be really concerned about what's the purpose, what are we trying to achieve? Yeah. Why does that not worry about? Why is it just yeah. enough to have happy kids and have a, mm. have a nice weekend? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're ever supposed to work it out. Yeah. I think it's the, the journey that counts. Is that you can have the ponderings and think about it, but I don't think you're ever supposed to have the, the answer nailed, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. I heard a guy say once, we want to save the world, make lots of money, and have a good time. That's something to be said for that. Yeah. You sort of missed out family, though, somewhere in there. Family's really important, too. Well, maybe having a good time. You can yeah, only yeah, have a good time, a good with time with your family. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for your time today thank and um, spending time with us and, and sharing your, your stories. And, and I would recommend anyone who's not read the book to, to do so. Um, clearly, if you're still reading it and getting a laugh over it, <laughs> just uh, shows it's, it's Parkinson's it's good. and uh, the dementia set in, that's all. <laughs> no, no, I think um, I think there's something to be said about that. It's actually it's a it's a funny book, but it's it's a real interesting book as well and, mm. and full of uh, inspiring things, I would say. Absolutely. Uh, so so um, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Sir. Cheers. As you'll hopefully know by now, if you've seen other episodes, this segment of the podcast is all about wisdom worth sharing. At the end of every interview, I look back as part of the editing process and discover some of the gems that came out during the conversation and summarize them here. Although starting out as a quiet and shy boy growing up in a sleepy suburb of Auckland, Kevin Bigger was a young boy with a bit of self-doubt in part, no doubt, due to his stutter. He read books about adventurers like Jacques Cousteau, and although he felt his childhood hadn't shaped his career too much, he did later recall writing a list of dream jobs, and one of those was to become an adventurer himself. Maybe that fanciful idea was forgotten about until his life forced him to consider what next. He'd worked as a consultant, but that wasn't a good fit for him. He wasn't enjoying the work, which he described as nonsensical and unstructured chaos. It didn't feel right, and rather than wait it out to see if it got better, or until someone made a decision for him, he took control and made the difficult decision to leave work, leave his relationship he was in at the time, and go back home, live with his mum, and start working out where to from here. Even during this time, when his life felt like it was in turmoil, he was having an adventure. I'm not sure that he saw it that way at that point in time, but he traveled to the US, the UK and Europe until his money ran out and then it was back home again to mum. It was at this point he remembered his list of dream jobs and decided to go work alongside people in those roles to see how they fit. An awesome idea when you think about it, how many of us do that before getting into a career that we could have for years, even decades? We don't even buy a car without trying it out first, so why would we accept a job we're going to spend maybe 40 hours a week in? It was an article on the news that got Kevin's attention about a woman who had entered the transatlantic rowing race with her husband. He had to pull out partway through, and she continued with the race by herself and completed it successfully. Kevin thought that if she can do that by herself, maybe I could do it. Clearly, he was fishing around for ideas at that time, not entirely convinced that this was what he wanted to do. He met up with Rob Hamill, a previous winner of the race, basically hoping that Rob would convince him that this wasn't a good idea. However, in his conversation, when he was told that there was a chance of dying, 
Kevin found himself hooked. The result was that he and his rowing partner, Jamie, not only entered the race, but won it, breaking records as they did. Kevin and Jamie went on to travel to the South Pole without the aid of being resupplied, a feat only a handful of people have ever achieved. Kevin argued that these achievements weren't extraordinary and that he himself wasn't extraordinary. But these adventures had helped him chase away the demons of self-doubt and overcome one of his lifelong challenges, the one he's most proud of, and that is becoming a professional speaker on the circuit whilst having a stutter. Something not many people would even contemplate doing, but he's done so now for over 20 years. Kevin said that people place constraints on themselves, always choosing to focus on the reason why they can't do things. Instead, they should be facing their fears, keep trying, stretching themselves further every time they achieve a new comfort zone. I think it's fair to say that Kevin has walked his own path and has enjoyed the journey and faced its challenges along the way. He's happier now than he's ever been, he's got rid of some of those demons and now lives with an improved sense of self-confidence that enables him to meet people from all walks of life and teach them life lessons based on his journeys. Hopefully you've been able to take many insights away from this interview that you can apply to your own life, work and legacy. Use it, share it with others. As I always say, sharing is like teaching and teaching helps us retain what we've learned and commit to change, which is necessary if we're going to enhance our own life's work. I hope you are happy, safe and successful in all that you do. And remember, live a life that's a story worth retelling. I'm Steve Worsley. And I look forward to seeing you next time on Life's Work, the podcast all about wisdom worth sharing.